If you're thinking about building your own house, here are some things to keep in mind. On this episode of the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast, Mike Riley and Mike Ferrante discuss the process from square foot cost to how much to pay an architect, all of this and more on the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast. Stay tuned. Hi, everybody. This is a a suntanned and relaxed Mike Riley talking from cold Cleveland after one week in Florida. And with me, sitting in the car freezing, is my uh, compadre, Mike Ferrante. Mike, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. (laughs) I hope you're drinking hot cocoa or coffee. Oh, no, you're uh, hot herbal tea or something to keep your brain synapse going, right? Yeah, 34 degrees right now. It's kind of chilly. Okay, well, 34 is not bad No, you know, for, for Cleveland winter. That's just your normal. I, I just returned folks from 80 degrees sunshine, South Beach. And when I was walking around with these earbuds on, I was in my bathing suit and a T-shirt, trying to stay in the shade, not to get too fried from the sun, blue sky, and palm tree. So how's that, Mike? Can I, can I rub it in even more? Yeah, nice. Where do you stay when you go? Uh, well, we stayed in an Airbnb for four days, which was nice. We used to stay around Lincoln Road and, you know, along the canal. And then uh, the last four days, we kind of splurged and stayed, stayed at our favorite hotel, the Cite, S-E-T-A-I. And the Cite was just wonderful, just beautiful hotel, lap pool for my swimming. So it was really great. But I know, hey, hey folks, I know you don't want to hear about this. So look, we're we're gonna we're gonna jump to to talking about a couple of things. First of all, I want to talk about building your own house. Uh, for those of you who are so inclined, who um, and we're Mike just got done building his own house, and so uh, it was a little bit of a uh, it got started when it, the market was white hot, and when it was finished, the market had cooled. Right? That, that couldn't have timed it more. That's for sure. You know, we built a spec house, which, of course, uh, spec stands for speculative or speculation. You build a house uh, hoping that you find a buyer when it's done. And, you know, in the market, we started this process at the end of 2021 when you could pretty much name your price and homes were selling in around 10, 12 days, depending on what month it was. And we broke ground in April of 2022, and by the time we hit the market, it was September of 2022, and everyone knows what happened from 21 to uh, the end of 2022. Of course, rates doubled, demand got greatly reduced, and well, we, you know, hey, we, Mike, they, Mike, they know because they listen to this podcast, and they know right. if they go back, they'll see what uh, September heat check was. Yeah, um, and you were right there. Uh, it was starting to cool down you were feeling it um yeah so for me i was there laboring and trying to beat the clock i mean i knew it was just gonna get worse and worse i mean it's still a good market and, and i did sell the house in i don't know like 18 days i think it was so still not terrible not the worst outcome but the point was that the timing wasn't great you know i thought i would have a bidding war and people fighting over this house and of course <laughs> reality set in and after a couple yeah. of price reductions i sold it in about 18 days Right, right. Well, best laid plans. So um, let me ask you a couple of questions uh, about building a house because we're we're planning and building our retirement home on the vacant lot at our Fairmont mansion that you uh, helped sell us. Um, did you have a design in mind? Where did you go to get your original design for the house? Well, we did we did our research online and we found plans that were available. Uh, sort of like stock plans. And then what we did was we we took those plans and tweaked them with an architect. So one thing I learned from that was don't buy the plans, the online sources. Now we bought ours from 84 Lumber, but we made so many changes to those plans that we would have been better off just having the architect start from scratch. The other thing is that those stock plans you get from any online sources, they don't necessarily take into account your local building codes. So even though most of it will probably be correct. You're still going to need an architect to go over the plans and figure out if anything needs to be changed. So again, my feeling was that by the time we paid the architect to do all that, he could have just drawn the house. 
Okay, next question. What would be your ballpark expectation about how much to pay an architect to, to design a house? I would say the range is 1500 to 3500 Now, of course, that varies wildly by the size of the house. The size of the house I'm talking about is your typical 2000 to 2500 square foot house. Okay, so about 1500 to 3500 Do Do people use uh, estimates like 1% of the building costs, like architects? That, that seems about right. Um, I don't, I think that most architects are probably billing based on the size of the house though, and maybe the complexity. So, uh, but you know, coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, that number is about right. I think, although I came in much under that, I was probably closer to a half percent of the cost. Okay. Okay. So that's number, what were some of the, uh, surprises that you ran into when you were building your house? So you said you got it done in five months and you were actively involved as the general contract and you said you did roughly about i don't know 250 man hours of work yourself on that right i did yeah and i was there daily sometimes a few times a day running for materials you know i had a couple amish crews and you know they don't get to the store too easily so i was running for materials i was uh monitoring the work making sure there was as few mistakes made as possible it, just with everything. So yeah, I did it in five months, just under five months, which is pretty amazing. Now we cut some corners at time-wise, not cost-wise, but time-wise, we did precast basement walls, which was a really interesting system. You've seen commercial buildings built with these things where they bring, bring in concrete panels with a crane and set the panels in place. We did a basement made out of that stuff and it was wow. incredible. A basement in a day. Wow. Wow. Cool. How big was your basement? Uh, the footprint was roughly 1,100 square feet. Okay. Now, when you do a basement, were you uh, in mindful of finishing it so I'd have a bedroom down there and a bath, or was just just raw, unfinished, people can do what they want? So we left it unfinished, but one of the cool things, and you guys have, have to look these guys up, but there's a couple different companies that do this. Uh, we used a company called Progressive Precast with a K. Uh, there's a company called Superior Walls. I think they're based out of either Michigan or PA, and they've been doing it even longer with the precast wall systems. But the cool thing about these walls, when they produce them in their factory, they already have metal studs built into them, and the insulation is already there. Wow. So literally, you just have to poke your wires through the studs. And by the way, there's already sleeves in the studs for any plumbing, wiring, anything of that nature that you have to do. You literally could run your wires, run your pipes, and hang drywall. That's wow. how simple it is. So, well, yeah, it was 10% more than a poured concrete wall, but with all of that, those extra amenities, the insulation, the studs already being there, and we did a nine-foot basement. Okay. Now, um, what about the second and third floors? I mean, the first and second floors, I should say. Did you just do conventional framing or we did, did. You think about doing, you know, just drop in panels already, already made? No, we did. So we bought a package from 84 Lumber and I mentioned them twice already. I really did enjoy working with them. I, I shopped around a little bit, but 84 gave us the best price. And there was a dedicated sales rep who was at my beck and call. If I needed something, I had one guy I called and he was familiar with my project. So that was nice. But no, it was all stick framed. And I did use Amish carpenters. Uh, they built me by the day. And okay. it went really, really quickly. Uh, I think we had about 12 days of framing to get the whole house built. Did you do the first and second floors? We did. So nine foot ceilings on the first floor, eight foot ceilings on the second floor. Now, I understand that it's cheaper to build up as opposed to out. Yep. Okay. Because that's because of the foundation, right? The right. The so we... When you build up, you just have framing and then, of course, finishes and whatnot, but you're going to have those costs regardless. When you build out, you have bigger, more foundations, you've got more concrete, excavation, you know, all those costs of building out. That's why ranches are more per foot than colonials, bungalows, Cape Cods. And you could do like, a, you know, the, you talked about these container ship kind of designs, which are more boxy, uh, more modern looking right yeah um, the but, shipping container i mean we could do a whole podcast just on shipping container homes but 
they're kind of like, you know, think of uh, Legos. You know, you've right. got these different size Legos and however you can imagine snapping them together, that's what you can do with shipping containers. Right, right. Why didn't you go that route? Well, first of all, the city we built in wasn't ready for it. I think it would have taken me an extra six to 12 months to get that pushed through. Wow. Uh, but also you are are limited in some ways by the size of your Legos. So shipping containers are only eight feet wide. Now, right. what some people are doing is setting them side by side and cutting out walls and combining them. Yeah. But well, you're still limited. You, so by the time you do all that work, what's the point, right? Right, uh, right. So, so really for the a true Lego. Yeah, yeah. And, and by the time you do all that, you don't really get the type of floor plan that you would get with a framed house. So two-story ceilings can be tricky. Like, And we did have a two-story foyer. Uh, for the layout we did, the, the tr traditional framed house was the way to go. Plus, this was our first spec home. I didn't want to right. start with one of these. Now, the next one I do quite possibly is going to be a ranch-style home where we do three or four, maybe five containers all set next to each other, you know, maybe in kind of a different layout, not just a big square, right. you know, maybe an L-shaped layout. Okay, let me get back to one of the questions I asked you about. You did the precast, ready-to-go basement walls, right? And yeah. so tell me again why you didn't do that for the first and second floors. Hey, let's stop here. We got to pay some bills. 30 seconds and we'll be back. If you've been listening to this podcast, then you understand or should understand the pitfalls of investing in Cleveland real estate. Say you're looking for an investment property to rent. And these are the things that could happen and often do. You overpay for a house and it's in the ghetto. Then you find that it's a money pit with endless surprise repairs. Your hapless property manager, who may be the brother-in-law of the realtor, gets a tenant who after three months stops paying the rent. Then the toilet explodes and you have nobody to repair it because guess what? The property manager is not answering the phone. Yep, that's the ugly side of the Cleveland real estate market. But we have a solution. Buy one of our properties. It's been inspected. It's been vetted. It's in a rock solid part of town. It comes with a gold star tenant paying top dollar rent and we manage it. Call us at 216-371-8160 if you're interested. Well, the um, I think the cost would have been more than framing. So, okay. you know, the Wait, commercial, the, the, the concrete is more used in commercial applications where there aren't a bunch of windows. Okay. So, so, so like if you're ever driving through Twinsburg and where the old uh, car plant was torn down and they built all those buildings like the Amazon Fulfillment Center and so forth. Right. Those are big warehouse style buildings that they're building uh, walls out of. And yes, they can put windows in them. My, my walls came with basement windows already in them, right. but that's a bit of a process. So okay. having a bunch of windows, uh, it's still more cost effective and you get a prettier finished product when you frame. Okay. All right. Okay. And your utilities, solar, just go conventional furnace, gas. Yep. That high efficiency, thing. yeah, high high efficiency gas furnace and water tank. So there was no chimney, you right. know, from being the home mechanics, the Riley painting and contracting home mechanics, probably 10% uh, <laughs> of your business probably comes from chimneys and related issues. Uh, right. But yeah, no, no chimney, all plastic vent pipe. And of course, your traditional electric. And, and we did run our electric service underground to make it a little prettier. Okay. Now, um, so bottom line, what did you think your square foot cost was? So we built a 2,500 square foot house and our cost of construction was just under 400,000. Okay. So that was uh, basically how, how much is that? Uh, give or take 150 a foot, you know, and, and that'll vary. So some people are probably listening going 150 a foot. That guy doesn't know what he's doing if he spent that much, but you know, we did high end finishes on this and, yeah. uh, 
really spared no expense. Plus some of the things we did to save time cost a little bit more. And, and okay. we did upgrades like nine foot basement, nine foot first floor. Um, we did right. big casement windows, uh, a right. lot of stuff that maybe I would do it differently the next time. And certainly I could build a house that was cheaper, like with double hung windows, for example. I oh, forget it. No, no. Okay. So, so let's just say 150 square foot, right? Yeah. So if you did a 2000 square foot home, and again, if you're designing the house yourself, like we're thinking of doing, you know, having lived in our house for 40 years, I mean, we know how we live. We know what rooms we use a lot, what rooms we don't hardly ever use a lot. So you've got a blank slate now. And if you put together your checklist, you know, maybe you, you use that guest room in the basement, guest room and shower in the basement. That's cheaper to do, right? That's right. Um, that's so now you're finishing the basement. So you're really maximizing out that 2000 square feet. Now, does the 2500 square feet include that 1100? It does not. Basement? No, okay. it does not. And and pro tip here, uh, if you're smart and you know you're going to have plumbing in your basement at some point, even if you don't do it today, put your plumbing in the floor. You got to right. do it before, because otherwise you're coming back later and cutting concrete and finding the pipes. Yeah. And, you know, exactly. so we did. It's called roughing in for a bathroom, future bathroom in the basement. Now, yeah, mm -hmm. I did. By doing that, I did lock in the position of the bathroom. But, hey, that's a lot better than having a least, concrete later exactly now and when you do a like a lot of people are setting up basement offices workout areas uh tvs down there guest room shower maybe even a steam room or something like that so i mean really you could do a 2000 square foot house on the second i mean first and second floor and a thousand square foot finished basement now you've got That's a right. 3000 square foot Absolutely. Um, and that would lower your square foot price, wouldn't it? Because um, it's cheaper to refinish a basement, right? Of course. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I'm speaking absolutely. with my contractor's hat on. Um, what about putting on a third floor? Does third floors get more expensive? I'm, I'm envisioning, I'll, let me give you some context, everybody. I'm envisioning a three-story house with that third floor being like, you know, a treetop type office with maybe a deck going out and just stacking them up. Um, is that cheaper or is it getting more expensive when you get up to the third floor? I didn't do it, but I would say that logic dictates that the third floor is that, you know, cheaper price per foot because you're building okay. up no additional footers or anything. So yeah, building up is going to be cheaper. When, okay. when you were describing it uh, in my mind, I was thinking wizard's tower. Yeah. What's a wizard tower before I say yes? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you said you said treetop office. I was thinking, you know, Mike Riley with a long white beard and a wizard's hat, you know, doing <laughs> alchemy in your wizard's tower. No, I want to have my company meetings where I'm out there, you know, <laughs> pontificating, giving my sermons and blessings to the crowd below, or maybe the mob that's coming to attack me. Who knows? <laughs> right pull, pull up the, pull up the drawbridge oh i forgot to tell you mike we're going to have a moat right oh i love it <laughs> piranha piranha filled uh not koi but piranha filled moat going around <laughs> anyways so going up to third floor and then you know our our place has a i mean you know the house we're in the vacant lot we're building on but it would be pointing south you'd have tons of sun so you can go in solar you if you're going to live there, if this was your house, like it is going to be my house, I'm thinking you're going to want to put in that 21st century heating, you know, like radiant heat floors, solar, geothermal, heat pump, that kind of thing. You follow me? Yeah. I mean, certainly if you're going to build this house for yourself, you consider those types of options. You know, when we're talking about investments and building as a business, you have to weigh the cost versus what you get on the resale. So, you know, we were trying to keep our price point uh, in the high 400s. So we didn't do any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, I think you just have to look at the payback period. So for, so for example, an easy one to think about is a tankless water heater. You know, you can buy a water tank and get it installed and you know what the cost of that is and how much you're going to pay for hot water over the course of, say, 20 years. 
then you can compare that to what the cost of tankless is and figure out what your gas savings is and figure out like what the savings is, where your break even point is. Uh, they've gotten so much better at the tankless water heaters that those now make sense. Uh, 10 years ago when I bought my house, I chose not to do one because the life expect expectancy of those was only about 15, maybe 20 years. And I'd be putting another one in about when I'd be breaking even on the energy costs. Right. I hear you. I hear you. Okay. All right. Well, listen, Mike, any final hiccups, curveballs to warn our listeners, warn me when you're building a house? Well, I think it's like anything else. We always talk about hiring the experts to do things for you. You know, certainly I had a background in construction, uh, but in hindsight, there was so much I didn't know, so many little mistakes I made, things I had to learn along the way. Uh, and I'll do a lot better on my second one. But I think part of the reason that my costs went higher than expected were my inexperience. So, you know, if if you're thinking about tackling a new construction project on your own, have a mentor, have someone who's there to help you along the way. Um, I thought I knew more than I did and it bit me in the butt. Uh, but, you know, certainly having the ability to do some of the work yourself is helpful. Now, most folks will probably hire a general contractor, a builder to do the work for them. And then it's like anything else. You're going to pay that premium, that markup, but you're going to have an expert who's going to be responsible for all those little things that you don't know. And there's a huge advantage to that, you know, get a good right. builder and it's worth it. Right. I hear you. Okay. All right. Well, listen, folks coming up uh, in a couple of days this weekend, we're going to have to do our February heat check, right, Mike? You can't That's do right. It now. It's, time. it's still January, but for a sneak peek, I know you haven't looked at your analytics. What's your, uh, what's your initial take? Well, we it seems steady. You know, we haven't really noticed a drop in activity, and that's typically what happens. After the first of the year, we start to notice activity increasing. Um, inventory, our, our personal team inventory is up about uh, 10 15% from where it was in December, and I think that's probably going to be pretty similar across the board. We'll see inventory up. We'll see prices start to creep up a little bit. Market right. time is probably about the same. We're not seeing a frenzy of activity yet. But I'll tell you what, I bet come March, April, May, it's things are going to get brisk again, even with rates. If, even if they go in the sevens, I think things are still going to be pretty brisk. I think the rates are going to level off, personally. My, my sneak peek, we'll get obviously a deep dive next yeah. weekend. On the, but, you know, my, my thing is, you know, inflation's leveling off. We're getting inquiries from people who want to work for us, which is always a canary in the coal mine if things are slowing down, not getting so manic. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you didn't you didn't uh, get that spec house on the market when it was white hot. So that's that's a, even a, another warning sign that things are getting a little bit more balanced, a mm -hmm. little, like you say, a little, little steadier. So uh, I want to just add one more thing to our discussion. And that is, uh, the, you know, the nature of real estate, the sexiness of real estate that we've talked about in past podcasts. You know, the best example, again, from past podcasts is who's going to make more money, uh, the garbage collector business or somebody who's in real estate. And quite frankly, the garbage collector is always going to do well because there's always going to be garbage. But meanwhile, with real estate, it's it's an up and down. It's a roller coaster. Things are always changing, as opposed There's to a, something that's not sexy, but is you know steady income. Yeah, as far as real estate agents, there's I don't want to call it quite a mass exodus from the business, but for the first time in quite a few years, there was actually a drop in the number of licensed real estate agents in Ohio. And I think that's yeah. indicative of what is being construed as a tough market. It's right. only tough, though, in comparison to what it was been. You know, it, you, you pretty much uh, had buyers bending over backwards to get houses and sellers who would list their house and it would sell in days instead of weeks. Now we actually have to work a little bit. And I think that's kicking a few people out of the market. Right. That's the market correcting itself. OK, Mike, well, let's let's we'll end it on that note and then uh, we'll. Uh... We'll have another uh, recording in a couple of days on February heat checks. So start looking at your uh, analytics. 
All right. As always, I'll have some interesting numbers for you, Mike. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Talk yep. later. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Cleveland Real Estate Investor Podcast with Mike Riley. Please add our show or follow us on Spotify, Overcast, Apple Podcast, or Spotify. Leave a like or comment on the video. All engagement is appreciated. Subscribe to us on YouTube as well for video content coming soon. For any Cleveland listeners or Cleveland Browns fans, you can check out our other podcast, Cleveland Browns Anonymous, for our weekly group therapy session. This is also on all the same platforms as the Cleveland Real Estate Investor.